Welcome to the Google Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Watson, and I'm doing a solo episode today, which is called This Too Shall Pass. But before I get to that, I just want to say hello to everyone tuning in, whether you're a new listener or you've been with me for a while. I really appreciate you tuning in. Um, as always, I sit down with inspiring people who are doing really good in the world. Basically, people that are making a difference that can inspire me and you to become better versions of ourselves. Because that's what this podcast is all about. Inspiring us to make the changes in our lives and be the change that we want to see in the world. Because God knows we need it right now. We really need it. We need it to step up. I'd never think there's been a more important time for us to connect with others, to speak our truth to share solutions and, like I said, be the change we want to see in the world. So, yeah, so let's get into today's episode. I'm a little bit, in some ways, I'm a little bit apprehensive about some of the things I may speak about this. I mentioned in the previous podcast, solo podcast, that I did, which was always darkest before the dawn a few months ago, that um, I always like to focus on the positives in life, and I really do. But I also feel it's an element that we have to... We can't just whitewash it. We can't just always focus like everything's all good. It's like kind of, you know, fake positivity. We really have to acknowledge the darkness as well. And I'm seeing a lot of darkness at the moment. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of light, potential for light, but I think that's going to come somewhat later. Or maybe the light's flooding in to see the darkness. There we go. That seems a better way to look at it. There's so much darkness, or we're seeing so much darkness in the world, is because there's so much light being shined upon it. And when the light is shined upon it, it's coming into the light and we're getting an opportunity to transform that on our own level, personally, internally, in our actions, but also collectively. So in many ways, this is the greatest time for transformation that we have ever experienced in our lives and potentially in the history of mankind. Now that's quite, quite big. It's very important that we change tracks, hugely important. I spoke much earlier on in the beginning of the pandemic about this was a huge opportunity for us to make some changes. And, um, well, we're knee deep in that stuff now, but it feels like there's certain forces at play. You want to use the word good, you want to use the word bad, it can be that way. So talking about the title of this podcast, you know, this too shall pass. I've heard this, this spiritual saying many times, and I just want to elaborate on that for a, a few moments we all have times in our lives which we do not enjoy we do not like and sometimes it can be very much changes it could be we're having a bad morning and that flips to us having a better afternoon and a good evening or it could be that we're in a we're in a bad place for a few weeks or we have a bad experience it could be that you have an accident in your car like a bump in someone or or you know any any things that can come out of the blue and we're not particularly enjoying them well, something that helps me, no matter how I feel, however I'm feeling emotionally, and it's been a real roller coaster for me recently, emotionally wise, and I'll probably move into that a little bit further, is for me just to remind myself this too will pass. These feelings will pass. And then you got to think on a big collective way with what's going on and how things are. We're two years into one of the um, most, what feels like, world changing events that's been happening through COVID. That this too shall pass as well. How long? I don't know. Um, but we'll see. But me having that recognition and for me to catch myself, like I'll have bad days, whether it's a bad health day or a good health day or whatever. And I mentioned good then because I'm moving to that in a second. But it's to allow yourself to see this, this feeling, this experience will pass. And then it's also remembering that the good times will pass as well. I think we try to hold on. We end up having an attachment. One and say, say you're in a really good place with your health and you're feeling good and whatnot, and then it, it slips by the wayside for a little bit, and you're not looking after yourself as much, and you, you're not exercising, you're not eating well, you're not in that place. But when you're in a good place, you want to hold on to it. Or if you're having a good day, or you're having a good experience, we want to hold on to that feeling. When actually the good times pass as well, they will move away as well, and. So that's something again that's been helping me to even recognize that because it seems to me that the issue seems to be in life with most stuff is that we have an attachment to the good things and a resistance to the bad things. We want to keep hold of pulling the good things and we want to push away the bad things. I honestly feel that that could very well be one of the things that's really holding us back in our life. Us holding on to good, wanting to hold on to good stuff, bad stuff, but it's like anything. It's like it's like the seasons each year. It's like when spring comes and 
and the roses blossom and they come out for a few days or weeks and then the petals fall. You know, that's what makes life so beautiful, so wonderful, so rich is the passing of things, good, bad, up, down, here to stay, gone tomorrow, you know, or so I say here today, gone tomorrow. So it's remembering that for me. And I think when I'm in that place, it becomes like you're not so living life so much from the ego of what you want and don't want. Instead, you're taking a bit of a step back. You are almost say for instance rather than being in the river being swept up in stuff instead I feel like you're taking you either on the side or you're on a bridge above it looking down we can become more the witness of our lives and what is unfolding so I just wanted to give a bit of an overview there of why I've called this podcast this too shall pass but also like I mentioned like I said in a previous podcast further ago you know yeah there's so much good that can be happening in the world it can feel like at the moment can for me, even for me, who's been championing the good for three years with this podcast, can find is finding it extremely challenging to find the good amongst all what I would say co- the COVID madness that we've been experiencing, particularly this year. This year, for me personally, feels way more intense than last year. I had this feeling in 2020, it felt like, you know, we're all in this together, we're all supporting the health workers, you know, we're taking this sacred pause for the first few months, a reset of choosing to reflect deeply on our lives. And I still see real benefits of that. Sadly, like other things, say for instance, Brexit and Trump getting in and all these sort of events that have happened, the way they've been swirled up by the media, swirled up by the government, swirled up by institutions and have created a real divide between society, created so much fear, so much propaganda. It's it's so intense right now. Um, so it's important for us to acknowledge the darkness. So I, like I said, I think earlier on, the light, there's so much light coming in now that it's shining a light on the darkness and it's you can't not see it. And I think once you see and get an understanding of what's going on. You can't unsee it. So I'm going to share some things about some of the darkness that I think is happening in the world. And the reason I'm sharing this, not because I want to give that energy, I want to shine a light on it. And it's an opportunity for me to to allow this to flow out of me as well, because I've had a lot of things on my mind recently. I've not been sleeping very well. I've been waking up with all sorts going on. And um I'm finding it really intense, energetically very intense right now. Also, I'm also finding it very galvanizing. I feel really inspired. I feel like, like I said, connecting with others and sharing more solutions and being the change we want to see in the world. My first episode that I ever recorded way back in, was it 2018 or 2019? I'm not sure. 2018. The title is Be the Change. Be the Change. And I just, in my own way, is Be the Change. Me doing this podcast is not, this is an opportunity for me to be of service to others, to help others in some way. Some of my podcasts reach thousands of listeners, which I'm very grateful for. Others reach hundreds. So even if this reaches hundreds, if I can help someone with these words, make you also feel that you're not alone. It's such an important thing right now is to not, for us not to feel like alone. We feel so isolated at times. So I want you to know you're not alone, that there's Millions of people probably feeling and thinking like you right now. And it's okay. This too shall pass. We're going to make it through to the other side. I don't think it's going to be easy. We're going to have to step up big time. We're going to have to step up in Jalizri. We cannot just sit back and say, it's okay. Those people are going to fight the corruption. Those people are going to be out there being leading the change, leading the charge. We all have to, in our own way, be willing to step up, to speak our truth, share solutions, and be brave. This is a time that we have to find that inner resilience, that inner bravery. We have to be willing to move past our fears because I think this we're reaching a very crucial, critical time in humanity. And it's it's gonna take participation from all of us to find a way forward. There's so many different versions of realities that we could go down. And it's going to take our participation personally to us to, to, to select which one we're going to go on. You may think that 
this world is just all set in stone and we just live on the way it is. It's 3D reality and live in Darwinism where it's survival of the fittest and everything's just unfolded from evolution. Yeah, I take a different approach to that. Um, I might tune into that a bit later on, um, which allows me to have find more peace and calmness in my life to realize the magic of life, the the hidden forces behind all of this. So even though I'm going to share a light on the darkness now, I could say that all of this is unfolding in perfect time and as it should be to awaken humanity to our deeper truths within so we can change course, heal a lot of trauma individually, collectively, so we can feel empowered to move forward in the best possible way. So let's get into this. So what is it that I feel will pass? Well, I definitely feel like COVID is going to pass at some point. Now, first of all, I since I've last done an episode, I've had COVID myself. Um, it came through the household. Um, my wife caught it. She went out um, with some friends and and then a few days later, she was starting to feel headachey and then it just kind of progressed a little bit worse. And then a few days after that, I caught it as well. Um, for my wife, the experience of it was she she had like a bad cold. But the thing is, is because of all the relentless fear mongering from the media the past two years, she did have a few moments where she got, you know, pretty like it was, it became more emotionally thinking, oh shit, you know, what's going to happen to me? Am I, is it going to get worse? Am I going to go into hospital? Am I going to be away from my daughter? Am I going away from me? Um, you know, so there was a few times with that, but it was in the end, within seven days, she was much better. She had sore throat, headache, cough, you know, tired, weak, stuff like that. Um, and then I caught it a few days later. To be honest, I ended up doing a test and I was feeling okay. And then I ended up the day later, I was feeling a bit. And then I got the positive results back or whatever. And I basically just had some aches and pains and down my back. It kind of worked its way down my back, top of my back, shoulders achy down and achy. So I, I think, you know, we I got off very mildly and, and Ruth did relatively as well. You know, um, if it wasn't for what was going on, wouldn't have thought pretty much or anything of it other than we needed a rest. And thankfully, it was mild for us because, you know, we've got a 14 month old daughter now who requires all our attention all the time when she's awake. So if we were both ill at the same time, that would have been challenging. Instead, it was kind of staggered. But anyway, that's just our experience of it. From our experience, I would definitely say the virus of fear is worse than the virus. That is my take on it, okay? And it's also when I start to unpick stuff and zoom out, I think one of the challenges is you can end up just listening to the news or listening to these bite-sized bits of information delivered from certain people, whether it's politicians or supposedly experts from the SAGE panel and all these people delivering it. And it whips up so much fear that it's not helpful. It is not helpful for anyone one in society to be to be put in this state of fear for so long when people are in a state of fear they can be manipulated basically the wall can be pulled over people's eyes when you are in a state of fear you will not think about things critically you will lose all reason you will just go into survival mode and from that you'll be like hand over your power to others and say you fix it for me yeah sure we'll do whatever you want you want us to be locked down you want us to not work you want us to stay indoors you want us not to hug anyone you want us to be um double jab then booster jab then another booster and so more you want to do another lockdown yeah 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 you know and there's not much resistance from the masses although there is a big growing movement that is happening where people are saying enough is enough this can't go on this, this can't go on anyway as we'd sent off tests and stuff like that and our tests have come back positive we get a call from our local gp to check in on us and see how we're doing you know it was nice of them to see how we were doing so well and their terms was you just need to ride it out and all you can take is paracetamol now for me, someone who is listening to this podcast will know that I am fascinated, deeply fascinated by health and well-being. I've worked with functional medicine doctors, with ecological doctors, with nutritional therapists, with herbalists, 
for the past 10 to 15 years, I have gone so deep into my health and uh, understanding of it to feel so empowered to the point where not feel invincible, but feel very empowered. I mentioned it in the past where, you know, you see these adverts which says one in two people will get cancer. And I say to that, well, I'm not, I haven't got a 50% chance. The changes in the way that I make in my life, my risks are a lot lower, okay? And as expected with COVID, and because of our age, our weight, our lifestyle choices, we got away pretty scot-free. Now, I'll get into this thing that frustrated me about the paracetamol in a minute, just saying just paracetamol. But the elephant in the room, we've got a real health crisis in this country. And we have had for numerous decades. Obesity is flying up. Chronic disease is flying up. Mental health is flying up. The way we live in society is not working for us. Look at it. All the markers are showing that we're in decline. We are going to be one of, I think it's this generation or even earlier generation, we will no longer be outliving our parents' life expectancy. It seems like it's the first time in history that that'll be the case or since records began anyway. So all this stuff around how big pharma and the food industry and stuff is going to help us and heal us and make us better, those systems are broke. Those systems are not working and are they going to work in a capitalist society? Or I've not necessarily got much wrong with capitalism per se. I've got an issue with the kind of the the rampant, like toxic version of it, and how companies drive is purely on profit. You know, profit for shareholders, control, power. Where there's a lot of other companies that are setting up, which I like to get a few more on my podcast, B Corp corporations, ones that put the people and the planet, not necessarily before profit, but it's on a par with profit. Like that's what their values are. So we're living in this country now with, you know, huge obesity around the world. And like I say, this country around the world, Western world particularly, we've gone so far off course. Now, I mention that because where's been the real focus of that the past two years? As soon as we knew, as soon as we come out of May time, 2020, we began to understand that who was who was dying from COVID? Yes, it was the elderly who very much likely have, may have died around that time anyway. I think the average age of death from COVID is 82. The average life expectancy in this country is 81.5. So, if you look at that, you know, those people around that were close to, were close to that. I did read something where someone said that COVID may have taken about six months off the life of those people. You know, that's still significant. You can do a lot in, in six months in your life. But what was shown is that a significant amount of people had serious underlying health conditions and were obese. I spoke to Dr. Anton Cricketh on this podcast, who's a functional medicine doctor who also works in the IC unit. And he's treated literally hundreds of COVID patients. He said to me, not one of them was slim. Every one of them was out of shape and obese. So what does that say? It, say, it says a lot. And it also says a lot how deafening the silence has been from the powers that be from the systems in place to encourage greater health and well-being shouldn't have it been once we realized that that's what's happened that it was affecting people with comorbidities with underlying health conditions the elderly shouldn't all the focus been on that all the focus could have really been on improving their health and well-being we could have all come together as a collective we could have empowered people to to eat better to grow their own food to be there supporting to go around imagine your neighbor is in one of them categories you could go around be helping them food making them food we could have had a real emphasis on health coaches because i know people who've been struggling with the weight for their entire life and just going to weight watchers a few times they might get a boost but it's not going to last and the reason i think it ties that into is because there's um there's an amazing guy called uh, Bruce Lipton, uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton. He's done some amazing books called The Bi- Biology of the Belief and The Honeymoon Effect. And he talks about how our conscious mind is has basically, is like 5% of our thoughts, of our conditioning, um, of our um, choices. Where from the unconscious mind, 95% of our choices come from. 
because it's just that conditioning, that pattern from our life. So you can have all the will in the world with that 5%, but that 95% is just going to trump you all the time. Unless if you're just going to go, that's why New Year's resolutions don't really work. You, you know, they last like a week or two because your conscious mind's really empowered and like, yeah, I'm going to do this. But it doesn't take long before that 95% just comes and like bulldozes you over. So that's why people will, you know, that's why Weight Watchers is in business, really. That's why it's a multi-billion pound industry. If it really worked, they wouldn't have any repeat customers. So imagine if we, we everyone gets assigned health coaches so they can be held to be held accountable, can encourage them, not just health coaches, but also therapists as well to help them get to the root cause of why they're eating like this, how they're feeling like this. You know, not just surface level. Like for me, a big thing for me is like we have to get to the root cause of stuff. I have a saying that I say a bit a few times is obvious to get back to our roots on many levels. And we have to get to the root cause of things. And that's what I found working with functional medicine, functional medicine doctors particularly. I've been able to get to the root cause of some of my health challenges, to feel empowered, to now to have basically engineered what I think is a really good diet for myself working out how much exercise I should be doing, fresh air, meditation, just looking at myself, look at it from a holistic perspective. Now, COVID from the powers that be has not been looked at from a holistic perspective. It's basically been lock everyone in, don't do anything, protect the NHS. And then as soon as the vaccine comes out, just basically we're aiming for 100% vaccination. Now, I mentioned this because... um one of the things that has frustrated me. So when when we found out we had COVID and the NHS calls us and they say, you know, you just have to ride it out and take paracetamol. If it gets any worse, get in touch and you might have to come to hospital if you like that. Now, the reason that frustrates me, because like I said, I've delved into the health of this and what's become very apparent from all my research, whether it be looking at Dr. Tess Laurie or Dr. Peter McCulloch or Dr. Um, Corey and um, over the, two of them in America, that Dr. Tess Laurie's down in Bath. Dr. Tess Laurie is the founder of the World Council of Health. And these people have been saying how important early treatment is for COVID. And early treatment is appears to be absolutely essential for, for COVID. Okay. And yet one of those things can be to take paracetamol or to take some ibuprofen. Um, or some aspirin in some cases but there's other things that we need to be doing as well so as soon as I knew that my wife had COVID like we take quite a lot of supplements I know we take a multivitamin I take vitamin C vitamin D probiotics um, zinc supplements magnesium we take these each day as part of our you know we realize that the way the food has grown around the world it's still even if we may eat organic or we may be grass reared beef or wherever it is there's still going to be an element of us being nutrient deficient because how badly the soil has been degraded over the past numerous decades so we're taking supplements anyway and that's something that i've basically championed in this household and with us for at least five six years after working with functional medicine doctors and herbalists and nutritional therapists um, to get the right intake for us. And everyone's different and on some regard. We're all kind of, you know, like my wife will take a certain vitamin because when she was trying to get pregnant, she'd take a certain probiotic or a certain vitamin and I will take different ones for certain health conditions. So you can tell it to yourself, but there is general things that we could all be doing. Now, what frustrated me was to say that we just have paracetamol. Now, as soon as I knew that my wife had COVID, I doubled down big time. I got really more into the research a little bit more. I said, what are these treatments that we had? What did we have at home already? So you need to be, you need immune support. So yeah, like I said, a multivitamin. I started taking, take vitamin D and vitamin C. I started taking high doses of vitamin C and vitamin D. I doubled my intake of zinc. I got hold of something called a uh, quelatin, I think it's called, because I didn't actually realize, which is great actually, is the quelatin helps the zinc to be absorbed into the body. So all these things to help support your immune system. Now, unfortunately, what seems to be an amazing thing, which Dr. Tosh Larry and Dr. Peter McCulloch are talking, is how amazing the effects are of, say, ivermectin have been as well. It's an antiviral. Also, you can use mouth and nasal wash. Now, this is really interesting. So it was Dr. Peter McCulloch was talking about on the Joe Rogan podcast. If you get an opportunity, that for me is, this is why the tide is changing and it's a game changer. It's the number one podcast in the world right now. 
that people are listening to. Now, this is a guy who, let me just give you a little bit of an overview on him. Dr. Pete McCulloch is one of the leading cardiologists around in the world. He's the most peer-reviewed doctor in the world. And he's also had 51 peer-reviewed articles on COVID and he's treated literally thousands of COVID patients. So if someone has been on the cold face so much and so um, so close to the ground, I'm going to listen to someone like that. I'm going to do- listen to Dr. Corey. I'm going to listen to Dr. Tess Laurie as well. Now, unfortunately, there's a narrative out there. There's a narrative out there that there's no, there's no early treatment and we just need to vaccinate everyone. The vaccine isn't treatment. I'm going to repeat that. Vaccine isn't treatment. So imagine if we were doing, we had early treatment protocols. Now, where are these early treatment protocols being? They're in Japan. They're in Bangladesh. They're in Mexico. They're in parts of North America because the likes of Dr. Peter McCulloch. But they're not around many other places. And what we're finding is in the places that it's using, the curve of COVID cases is going to the floor because of it. Because this is treatable. COVID is treatable. Dr. Peter McCulloch has stated that I think there's something 800,000 deaths in COVID in America. Now, I think it's careful. We have to be very careful with labeling the deaths because do you either die with or of COVID? And there's a big difference, isn't there? I think a significant amount of those people have died with COVID, but it's not the main reason they have cancer, heart attack, other issues that were going on. And it just happened to be in their system at the time. Yeah, there's ones where COVID's pushed them over the edge. And there's others where people have been healthy and COVID has killed them. Now, he says, out of those 800,000 people, now I will put a link to the Rogan podcast. You can listen to him. You can check him out. I think he speaks beautifully, very calmly, intelligently. He says he is. The reason why he's leading the charge in this is because he said he is armed with the truth. And the truth will prevail and the truth will set us free. He says he could have saved 85% of those deaths if an early treatment protocol was created nationwide for COVID. He's managed to treat with his network of about 300 or 500 doctors, many millions of patients in America as well. But he believes that if he was able and he was able to change, like he's been up in Congress to speak about this. And YouTube took down his Congress testimony to take down a doctor, one of the most qualified doctors on this in the world to remove his his analysis off off YouTube. That's unacceptable. That level of censorship. We need, everyone needs to be able to get, make a balanced review. People need to have informed consent. People need to know what's going on. How are we going to know what's going on if there's just a blanket coverage, there's one narrative that is basically, there's no early treatment. If you're really going to come to hospital and all we can do is give you a vaccination. Now, that for me is inhumane. It's madness. So if this really, like I said, it tie, when I start connecting the dots to this, if this was really all about health, then there would have been a real focus on people who had underlying health conditions, who were obese, and we would have put all our energy into making them better versions of themselves, healthier, fitter, empowering them. I feel empowered around my health. It feels really good to feel empowered around my health, to feel like, you know what? Like, I never used to. I didn't. I used to get bowled over by stuff. I go to the doctors probably every few months saying like this wrong, that wrong. If anyone wants to delve into my own journey with health, there's um, there's a podcast that I did. I'm trying to remember the name of it, which is called, that's it, Your Health is Your Wealth. Um, it's a bit earlier on. I did it about a year or two ago or maybe. And that delves into my own journey and how amazing. And it's so true, the health is your wealth. Now, I'm seeing things that I do not like right now. Like I said, early treatment protocol is not being accepted. Now, here you go. Here's one of the reasons why that could well be. The vaccines have been rolled out as emergency use on emergency use only. And the only way they can get given that pass as emergency use only is if there's no other effective treatment. The effective treatment is being suppressed. Now, I know someone, a family friend, extension of family friend, who's passed away from COVID. How would they feel? How would their family feel if they knew within a few months of COVID, 
we knew from all the doctors, particularly in North America and around the world, that were taking this into their own hands, that were willing to work with off-label drugs to, 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 to treat this. How would they feel if they knew that that information was suppressed? And you know, you ask it, why is it suppressed? Pharmaceutical industries, the pharmaceutical industry has been known, and I'm not all down on the pharmaceutical industries, you know, they do, I'm sure many of them will do, there'll be many good drugs out on the market. There will be, there is. I'm not just here to just say there's not, there will be that will help people, okay? But there's also another side of it that you only have to look at, say, Pfizer. They, I believe, was it Pfizer that they had the biggest criminal fine in history? So you could say the company is criminals in some ways. There's other cases, many, many, many other ones, as well as in the past. They've had to, years later, I think even one recently, which was 15 years ago, something to do with a cancer, they've had to pull the drug because it was actually creating the cancer or making it worse. Um, now, isn't that insane to think that, you know, so drugs get pulled all the time, fines get levied all the time. Now, what we've seen was a bit of an arms race with all of this. Everyone was pushing for, you know, all the companies, vaccine, vaccine. Now, here's the thing, again, if they, let's think about this. If it was all about health, it was all about humanity, profit would have been put to one side. And you might say, well, that's not possible, but surely shouldn't it, you know? If it was really a matter of, like, this is wartime thing and everyone's dropping like flies, shouldn't it have been about, well, it's not about profit. It's going to be not for profit. And we're doing this for humanity but there's a real drive, but it's not, that's not the case. There's billions being made from this. Hundreds of billions is being made from this. We're living through the biggest transfer of wealth ever during COVID. The billionaires, I think it's their wealth has increased by 5 trillion. And there's something like a billion people who've gone been pushed into poverty, or maybe that's hundreds of millions. So many that are starving um, from these measures, from the lockdowns, from the mandates, so forth doesn't seem to be stacking up for me. I'm telling you, it doesn't seem to be stacking up for me. Now, one thing I wanted to mention is, so I've worked in design, marketing, and PR for the last 20 years. I've been part of hundreds of campaigns with even with the NHS as well in England, and have produced many pieces of design work and campaigns, national campaigns, local campaigns, to... Um, change behavior, to encourage behavior, to encourage behavioral change. And what will happen is when we receive a brief from whoever it is, the NHS or a certain one, there's an element of it where you'll have the target audience, but you'll also have tone of voice. And what, and what I mean by tone of voice is, it means that how do you want this campaign to be delivered? How do you want the do? You, how do you want it to campaign to hit the spot? Do you want it to be empowering? Do you want it to be informative? Do you want it, you know, all them things? Well, one thing I'm wholly aware of with the COVID narrative and literature that's coming from the NHS and the government, this is a very hard hitting, extremely negative, fear based campaign, and we've seen it since the beginning. You see videos of families together, and black smoke is coming out the mouth as if to say anyone could have it you could pass it on to anyone and pass it around you've got other ones saying you know with hard-hitting ones about how we have to take huge responsibility like people are dying because of us now is it helpful we we're living in a i'm telling you a mental health epidemic right now it's been building for decades and this has just put things over the edge people's mental health is at breaking point suicide is is skyrocketing do we need more of this do we need more of this fear-based thing i guess say i've worked in in marketing and pr for 20 years when i see stuff out there i'm able to deconstruct it very quickly i can see what the brief was what the angle is where they're trying to get is so i can connect the dots from that and i'm seeing that across the board where's the empowering messages where is the messages that are coming out telling people like the national campaigns about taking vitamin c through the winter months boost people's immune system take vitamin c take a multivitamin zinc and so forth we're not seeing that that should be getting plastered everywhere if it was about health that's what we would be telling people but we're not we're saying 
there's no at-home treatment for COVID. There's no early treatment. All you can do is take some paracetamol and ride it out. And then they're saying the solution's the vaccine. But as we're seeing with the vaccine, the vaccine doesn't stop transmission and it doesn't stop infection. There was something recent that I've seen in Denmark, 70% of cases in young people with the Omnicom variant were fully vaccinated. And yet they're saying, get out, get the booster, everyone get vaccinated. It doesn't make sense. The saying get vaccinated is like it's your moral duty to get vaccinated. If the vaccine stopped transmission, stopped infection, possibly so, but it doesn't do that. From what I understand now is that what it does is it reduces your symptom severity of your symptoms. Now, severity of your symptoms in anyone 50 or 60 and younger, particularly young, healthy people, are very mild. When we had COVID, it's highly likely that our daughter, who's 60 months, caught it as well. Nothing from her. No symptoms, no nothing. She was, Ruth was breastfeeding her all the way through it. I was with her all the way through it. She would have probably caught it as well. And yet, she was fine. I know other kids who are 4, 5, 10, 12, it's just very mild. It was pretty mild for us as well. So if the vaccine doesn't stop transmission, doesn't stop infection, but it reduces symptoms, then in that case, doesn't it make sense that only the elderly and the vulnerable would need to take this to stop them from dying or going into hospital? Would that not make sense? And instead have a real focus on getting everyone else fit and healthy and getting them fit and healthy as well? So many things don't make sense for me. And and also think, since when did natural immunity get scrubbed from the English language? That's how we've evolved and we've gone on for our entire existence is that we develop natural immunity. The body is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. There's an Israeli study, largest of its kind, 2.5 million people were studied during a period of time in 2020, or it may have even come out in 2021. I think it was over a six month period. It shows that natural immunity is six to 13 times more robust than the vaccine. Only two in a hundred people previously who had COVID got reinfected, yet 40 in a hundred people who've been vaccinated got infected. That's a huge difference, isn't it? So it goes to show how robust and how strong natural immunity is. Nobody's talking about it. You're not allowed to talk about it. I believe on social media, the hashtag natural immunity can't be used. What is going on? Again, I keep saying this question. If this was really about health, why are we not focusing it on health? Why is the 100% focus on vaccination? Doesn't stop transmission doesn't stop infection. How many, you know, loads of people, don't you? Everyone listening to this will know loads of people that have been vaccinated that have had COVID. Currently, I believe that in England, after they did the booster rollout, there was something like six in 10 cases or more from vaccinated people. Six in 10 people in ICU are vaccinated. 80% of the deaths in this period of time since the boost, the first booster got rolled out, have been in fully vaccinated people. Now you could say, I think in this country we've got an 80% uptake in vaccination rates. So it kind of looks like it balances out there. So 80% of deaths have been fully vaccinated, but also 80% are vac- from the country have been vaccinated percentage wise. So that means 20% of deaths are unvaccinated. and also means 20% of people um, are unvaccinated. So it kind of feels like it balances out. Yet, where's the discussions on this? I'm not seeing, where are these discussions in the public arena, on mainstream media? Why are we not doing, look at, really looking at the data, questioning the data, having people on from both sides? It's not happening. There is one voice being shared. Now, I just find, I find it particularly frustrating and um, I feel some lines have crossed for me recently. And it comes to a point where you say, what's your breaking point? At what point do you say, I'm not taking this anymore? 
and you finally speak out. I'll speak out with people, I'll speak out sometimes, I spoke out a little bit on my previous podcast, but right now probably I'm stepping up a little bit more, I'm willing to speak my truth, and I'm also willing to accept that I might be wrong. We can't, don't don't be scared to say something just because you think you may be proven wrong. I'm completely open to having my views challenged and to grow. There was a time, a period of time where I was a vegan for four years and I 100% believed in it. And then I started to see things going wrong in my health and I started to work with some health specialist and he started to show me actually maybe it's not the right thing for me and to take me down a different way. But I really believed in veganism at one point. I believed it was helping many things. Sadly, it wasn't helping me. I changed my belief system on that. I've changed my belief system on a lot of stuff. I may very well change my belief system on this, but I'm willing to say what I see now from how I've connected the dots from stuff. And the thing that's crossed my line is seeing some of the things that are going on in Australia, internment camps that have been built, that were originally used for people that were coming into the country to be staying in there for 14 days, are now being used for the unvaccinated. The army are turning up at people's door and they're taking people who are considered to have been in contact with someone with COVID, they get taken to these internment camps and te- left them for 14 days, even if they pop up, they test negative. They're staying in these internment camps. It's insane. And there's many other cases. If you have a look in Australia, what they're doing, it's, I think we've got to, for me, I'm stepping up now, I'm speaking out for me and I'm making changes in my life because I'm willing to do this because I'm seeing what's happening in other countries. And I'm like, that ain't coming on my doorstep, even though it feels like it's getting pushed. But internment camps for people who were, haven't even got COVID, but are having to stay in there for 14 days and having crazy fines sent to them. If they wouldn't have come with them, it's 5,000 fine. If they take the mask off in the internment camp, there's hundreds or thousands of fines. It's like insane. Like in Australia, there's something like a few thousand deaths from COVID from a population of 35 million. The response to this, this virus is completely, completely imbalanced. It doesn't make sense. Australia, Austria in Europe is mandating vaccination for the entire population. A third of the population wasn't vaccinated. It's getting mandated. In Germany, police are going in, asking to see people's papers, just randomly checking them, saying, show me your papers. The police are walking around with two meter sticks outside to make sure people are socially distancing. Now, I think Germany and Austria need to have a look and think, hang on, have we seen this before? Having people to show their papers. And like I say, the vaccine does not prevent infection or transmission. So what's really going on at play here? You know, and I watched a video the other week and people, when people say that you're comparing what's going on now to say Nazi Germany, They get really offended. But there was times before the war broke out that people people say, why didn't you say something? Why didn't people speak up and say something? They said, because it just happened bit by bit by bit. Over the course of a number of months, years, things started to get taken away from people. People got segregated. One survivor spoke about how it first started off by saying, Jews can no longer go to, to public swimming baths. And at first they were saying, oh, it's okay, it's just swimming baths. Then they said, the kids can no longer, Jewish kids can no longer mix with other kids. Then it went from shopping. You can't go in the shops until after 5 p.m. That's the only time Jews can go in there. Jews were thought of as unclean and carrying disease to create a division, to get the German public on board, People were getting brainwashed. We know now people were brainwashed into this. And what we're seeing now in society is a segregation between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. The last thing we need is more division. We need to connect people. We need to be bringing people together. We need to feel like we're being coerced. We're being lied to. We're being manipulated. At our core, we've got so much in common with each other. We all want the best for ourselves, for our health, for our family, our friends. And I believe that's the case. But when you're just getting one narrative, one voice that is coming from the corporate press, coming from the medias, and one thing to mention is the alarmist extreme analysis of the data. 
um, predictions that's coming from supposedly, and I'm doing inverted comment experts that are coming out, Dr. Neil Ferguson, other people that are coming out with their predictions. Time and time again, they get it wrong. Over and over and over. Why aren't we going back and looking at this? Why aren't we questioning it? Why aren't we saying, well, hang on, if you're coming out now saying there's going to be X amount of deaths and we need to lock down again, why don't we go back and look at your estimates from, say, March 2020 or your ones in the summer of 2020 or last Christmas and see how outrageous they were? And let's see if they max up. Instead, there's been a huge failure of them. And this is crucially important because policy, lockdowns, mandates, vaccination rollout is getting push forward on these extreme scenarios. Look, at there's a really good link. I'll include a link from the te- the spectator, which shows analysis of the data of it. And it shows how wildly wrong it is. Um, some of the estimates of it and how it's nowhere near like that. These people need to be held accountable. They're playing with people's lives. They're playing with people's uh, jobs, with careers, everything. We are tiptoeing into an authoritarian totalitarian dictatorship if we're not careful and this is happening worldwide there's a few countries that are not partaking in this um and you know like i said this is my breaking point mandating vaccination for people in austria so 35 percent of people who are not vaccinated in austria what are they going to do now interesting thing for me and this is where we can be empowered ourselves a mandate is not a law a restriction is not a law We've seen in America, America mandated the vaccine for anyone with over 100 employees, for something like 100 million Americans. Those mandates are crumbling in the court of law. They're falling bit by bit by bit. I believe that the government's realised that they know that they cannot mandate this. Because one thing, why? We've got the Nuremberg Code. We've got people need to have conform, informed consent. How can you have informed consent when you're not told about the side effects of a vaccine? You, and the fact that, I'm gonna, the amount of times I must repeat this, it doesn't stop transmission, it doesn't stop infection. How can you mandate something like that? It doesn't make sense. I speak to some people about this and it looks like the eyes glaze over. Have they taken the Kool-Aid? And I'm not here to say, I don't want to use the term us versus them, people need to wake up or whatever. We're all at our own journey. I like to feel that I'm in a position, I've spoke about this in other podcasts, The Truth Will Set You Free. About in 2011, I went down a deep dive into the way I felt like the world was being run. I was absorbing so much information. I was looking at the way the money system is created, how corporations are, how corporations are actually running the governments. Uh, It's not the government's the other way around. It was like the money system was controlling the government, everything, you know. And the pyramid was very much like the people at the bottom and we were kind of living in this. Um, let's just say, you know, look at the, look at the, do you think, do you think things around the world are um, like this by accident? Every single day, is it 10,000 children die who were under the age of five from starvation? More people have died during COVID from starvation, children under the age of five than COVID, which is affecting people in their 80s. Where's the focus on those five-year-olds? If I'm going to be honest, the five-year-olds that are dying, people under five, that's not just five, these will be one-year-olds, babies that are six months old, two months, three months. You know, that breaks my heart to think, I've got a daughter who's 40 months, that someone's baby or young child is dying from malnutrition when we live in a world where there's more than enough where 30% of the food gets wasted we've lost our humanity when are we going to wake up and see what's more important yet the focus has been on covid and and look into like people like say the average age of death 82 where's the emergency for those children Where's the emergency for those poor children that are dying of malnutrition, starvation around the world? Far more of them have died since COVID started than from people with COVID. Where's the emergency for them? This isn't by accident. This is by design. These systems around the world are death-eating systems, unfortunately. We're seeing it. it. Sounds like an extreme, quite a horrible term to say, doesn't it? Death-eating systems. But it feels like it. You've got the National Health Service since it's been about since the after the war, was it the 50s? 
would you say the nation is healthier since that's been created? Since the since the pharmaceutical industries have been rampant with stuff? Would you say the world is healthier? No, chronic diseases are up something like from 4% to 50%. Obesity is flying off, off the rails. We need to we need to completely reorder and reorganize society and our systems. And this is probably an opportunity for it now. And when you feel like the walls are coming in with what's going on now, we can make these changes because we can be galvanized. If this wasn't going on, this is why I see the positive of this. If this wasn't going on, I wouldn't feel so galvanized to be willing to, to make some radical changes in my life. I'm speaking to people every week, every day who are also starting to question stuff and who have been questioning it for a long time, but also new people coming up and going, no more. They've had the two vaccines and they're saying, what? I need to keep having a booster. And where does this lead? Well, we've got the vaccine passports that have just been introduced into the UK. Yeah, you can take a and uh, do a test on the day and stuff, but lo and behold, all the tests have suddenly um, ran out. Quite, um, quite a coincidence, that, isn't it? As the vaccine passports come in. Where does they lead to? I saw a video in the other day uh, from Sweden where someone is creating a a chip that goes into people. You have a chip that goes into you which contains your vaccine status. Do you want to be walking around like that? To get into places, you have to show your arm to show that you're you're up to date with your vaccine. Yet we're seeing just recently, I saw, I think there's certain cruises around the world require fully vaccinated people. There's one cruise with so many people on. There's been a massive outbreak of COVID on it. It's got a vaccine mandate. No one can get on there without the vaccine. Yet we've got outbreaks of it. It doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. This is why for me, it's not about health. It's about control. It's about power. It's about, re- they want to reorganize society. The vaccine passports lead to a digital ID. The digital ID is linked to a social credit score system. Have a look in China. Do your own research on this. Check out the social credit score system in in China and how that works. For instance, if you were to share something on Facebook that the government doesn't like, your score will drop down. If you aren't eating well enough and buying the right food, your score goes down. If you drink too much alcohol, your score goes down. These are things that happen on it. And what happens when your score goes down? You can't use public services. You can't book a train ticket. You can't book a plane ticket. You can't go to stuff. Do you want to live in that society where we're fully controlled, where you constantly just feel like you're being watched because you've got a chip in your arm? Do you want to live like this? I don't want to turn into a machine. This is... Where we're going, this path... These paths that we're seeing now, we're getting an opportunity to choose this. And I am not compliant. I am not going along with this. Why? Because I don't trust the government. Okay? Look at all the revelations recently, about The revelations that have been going on for years and years. You just saw now recently Boris Johnson and all them having parties during the lockdown last Christmas. Families can't see the loved ones as they're dying. They have to look at them through a glass or look at them through an an iPad while they're dying. And the, and the prime minister is having parties, 40 of them, 50 of them, or no masks on, no social distancing. These are the people that are making the rules that everyone else should do and they're not following them. It goes to show if it was so serious, if it was so, so serious, they would have been following it as well. Yet, it's one rule for us and another for them. And it's the same with all the elites, all the rich, okay? We have to say no. We have to become aware of what's going on. Do you want to live in a system, a social credit card system? And here you go. Here's the final thing. What does that lead to? It leads to, once there's a digital ID in place, once a social credit card system, that then becomes central bank digital currency. So cash will be obliterated from the system. Everything will be on your chip, potentially in your arm, completely controlled from the central system. If they want to take money away from you, they can. If your credit score drops down, it can. And even what they're looking to program in it is a time limit to spend money. 
Can you imagine a time limit to spend money? This will stop people from saving, from building wealth. And like I said, I don't trust our government. Look at the stuff going past. Look at the way they, the, the money they've spent on track and trace, 37 billion. The handouts that they do to peers and all the corruption that goes back to them taking. You know, it goes on and on and on. Do you trust these people with this stuff? Do you trust the corporations with, with this information to control us? I don't. I believe there's very good people. I believe there's very good doctors, very good nurses, very good politicians all across the board, very good business owners, very good employees. I know in our heart of hearts, there's some amazing people out there. Unfortunately, the systems in place, the way they've been set up, the way they've run, not so good in my eyes. Like I said, if we really had a focus, why aren't we looking to save those children, all those kids that are dying of starvation? Why aren't we looking to clean the water, clean the air around the world, have a focus on that? Where's the focus on that? It's not there. So here we go. You know, where are we right now? I think that we're in that part of the film. If you're a massive fan of Star Wars, I also love Harry Potter and stuff like that. In Star Wars, it looks like we're in that part of the film where the Empire is taking over. Okay. Or in Harry Potter, where Voldemort is back and the darkness is sweeping over. Um, the ministry, that's the phase that we're in now, okay? Now, it's going to take a gigantic shift, a, a gigantic awakening for us to shift away from this to find a better cause. But we can't do this by sitting on the sideline and thinking other people are going to do for it. Look in Star Wars, look at the, the Jedi or Rey or Luke Skywalker. They have to go through training. They have to do the training. They have to grow. They have to be empowered so they can then defeat the darkness. Now, I don't like the term defeat because I'm very much a believer in non-violence and looking at what Gandhi did in India when he defeated the British Empire through a, 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 a non-violent movement. Now, that's the way forward through this. We're, sh we're being showed some very... What feels like um, very strict measures around the world. Like I said, what's happening in Australia, what's happening in Germany, Austria, other parts of the world. I believe in Norway, they just banned alcohol. Yeah, good, good luck doing that over here. Jesus, I think people would really get off the couch then if they banned alcohol over here. Um, it's time for us to step up. In those films, like I said, it takes. we're in our training mode now. And if it wasn't for what's going on, that's why I believe that we will look back at this time as the most amazing old time of awakening. It was the trigger point. It was the one that got us to change tracks, to choose down a different path. One that is, oh, there's so much more love and compassion and, and empathy for the world. And we're changing the systems. One that at the life generating, not death generating. One where we make the choice to think, let's put all our efforts in healing those poor kids around the world. Let's focus on those, you know, but we're going to have to go through this now and it's going to take us stepping up and saying no. I believe it's going to take an element of, yeah, mass disobedience, non-compliance in the madness, but also non-violence, a non-violent revolution of consciousness. That's what it's going to take. That's what I believe. What if all this was now was unfolding, was for our highest good, pushing us to heal those parts of us that out of alignment? There's a quote from Eckhart Tolle that has become a real mantra for me. I have it on post-its. That's a good thing I have to share that. Basically, when I come to my desk now, in front of my desk, I have a, a post-it that says, take a breath, you've got this. And I've got this now as I'm talking to you. Other times, I'll have other post-its around and there's just one from Eckhart Tolle which says, accept every moment as if though you chose it. So then whatever's going on, whatever's happening, rather than fighting it, resisting it, it's accepting it. We need great acceptance right now to, to see what's going on. If we're going to make this paradigm shift in health and well-being and across the board, I could say this podcast is empowering people to become better versions of themselves. You're not alone. If you're listening to this and you feel alone, you're not alone. There's many people that feel like you as well. There's many people that are questioning stuff at the moment. Look at the shift in health. Check out 
Eckhart Tolle, like I mentioned, Wim Hof of his breathing technique, Dr. Joe Dispenser. Wow, you want to see what he's doing. Some of the meditations and the healing techniques that he's got. He talks about how you do some of the things that he's doing. You don't need any flu jabs. You don't need anything. You've got the power within us to access that part of us, which is, ah, oh, you can tap into that part of us, which has got everything that it needs. Oh, what a time, eh? What a time to be alive. Um, Self-care is so important right now. Um, I'm having to say this to remind myself to do this, Um, to breathe more, to come into my body, to get outside, to eat fresh air. I think of a term when people saying, you know, protect the NHS. Well, I'll tell you how I'll be be protecting the NHS this winter and every winter. I'll be eating well. I'll be eating an organic, whole food diet. I'll be making most of it from scratch. I'll be drinking fresh water. I'll be taking my supplements. I'll be maintaining a healthy body weight. I'll be looking after my mind. I'll be getting outside in nature. That's the best subscription that we could have. That's the best antidote I could think I could have. And I'll be sharing and connecting with people. Connection is so important. Hugely important. Freedom over fear, folks. That's why I say freedom over fear. This too shall pass. However you're feeling right now, like I say, this has just been an opportunity for me to get stuff off my chest. I've spoken for over an hour. It's kind of just flooded out of me. I made a few notes yesterday. It was just like, you've got to do this. Um, for me, you know, and may this help some other people. I reckon it does. I had my first awakening in 2011. I went down a rabbit hole, lots of rabbit holes. I started to see the way the world was going. It took me some dark, dark, dark places, but it was extremely empowering because it gave me an opportunity to to not participate in those things anymore, to make some changes in my life. And I've made some drastic changes in my life the last 10 years. And in 2012, I found meditation. I found other things. Um, developed a lot of my spiritual beliefs back then to tap into deeper parts of myself. I needed to go through that in 2011. I, I, you know, not many people know this, but I had only just been recently married and within a few months, we were really at breaking point because how much I had changed because of all the things that I absorbed and all the stuff I was doing. Like, you know, I think my old business partner said it looked like I'd had some sort of um, kind of religious awakening or something. And it was in many ways, but for me, it was a spiritual awakening. And I believe I'm going through a second one now to take me even deeper. So I'm very interested and fascinated for what's going to happen in 2022 and which parts, deeper parts am I going to connect to? My soul, my guides, to be more of service, to help others, to help me, to help myself grow. We need to find our tribe more than ever. And I don't mean tribe because we need to feel we want to... um, feel disconnected or not disconnected, divide from other people. We need to find people who are thinking like us to connect with us. I said it at the beginning. It's never been a more important time to connect with others. Speak our truth, share solutions and be the change we want to see in the world. In 2022, I'm going to be focusing far more on the solutions with you all. Ah. Well, I'm, I'm really grateful. If you stayed with me to the end, I'm really grateful. I would like to think, yeah, I have focused on some of shining the light on some of the darkness, the darkness that I'm seeing, but it's only because I've got the light within me to do that. We all have. Remember, what if all this was happening now for our highest good and it was going to push us to grow, to expand, to find parts of us that need to be healed? Heal our relationships, heal our bodies, heal the planet. We've got an opportunity for that now and potentially this next decade. It could be rough in many ways, but it's an opportunity for us to hold the line, to to stand up for people's rights, to yeah, realise that we are sovereign beings at our core. And we're so powerful, so incredibly powerful. All of us can tap into different parts of ourselves. We can move beyond what's going on. And yes, this too shall pass what we're going through. And remember... It's that attachment that we have to the good that can be an issue in our lives and also our resistance to the bad. Don't resist what's going on now. Embrace it. Embrace what's going on. Acknowledge it. See it for what it is. And that's when we can transform it. 
And what do I think the answer is overall? Well, the Beatles said it pretty well, isn't it? Love. All we need is love. And that's what we are at our core. We are love. And I think truth comes from love. I think connection comes from love. I think being willing to serve others. I've said in this podcast many times that if we can move into a place of service, of helping others, we're going to change the world. We're going to change our lives. And actually by serving others, we serve ourselves. It comes back to us tenfold. I'm going to leave it there for today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Um, I'm humanly grateful for those that get in touch with me, that leave me messages, that share this podcast. And yeah, if you've enjoyed this, please share this with a friend, someone that you think as well that may feel a little bit like how I feel or is willing to. And one thing I will say is that, you know, you may not agree with everything I've said here and that's okay. And I think that's part of the healing that we have to go on. There's so much divide inside society. It's so important that we're willing to listen to other people's opinions, to acknowledge them, not just to shout them down, to acknowledge them, to listen to their point of view, to recognize that they have their own fears. But I have my own fears of what may happen. And that's why I'm willing to speak up now and say, no, I'm not going along with that. Not when I look at it and zoom out and see what's going on. Like I said, once you see what's going on, you can't unsee it. So, yes, thank you for listening. Please share this with a friend or share it on your social media channels to allow this message to reach more people. And I wish you a really amazing 2022. It's going to be bumpy. There's going to be challenges ahead. But like I said, like Eckhart Tolle says, if we can accept every moment as if we chose it and realize that this too will pass, whatever's going on in our lives, we'll find a way through this. We always will. We always do. And life is, is this life. Wow. God, how amazing is this life? Anyway, yeah. Until next time, everyone. Have a good one.